Okay, so root causes. Um, I appreciate you all's patience with me. And uh, next slide, please. Is it Rashawn that I'm speaking to? Yes, okay, great. Yes, sure. so, Okay, great. So our organization um, is six years old. Um, we recently revisited our mission and vision because we recognize that anti-Blackness is a global phenomenon. So we created a transnational team and we're doing global learnings, but and how that impacts our mission is that MBEC creates global solutions that optimize. So often we talk about um, reaching uh, equity or, but we wanna not just survive, we wanna thrive. We wanna optimize Black maternal infant and sexual reproductive well-being. So stressing that this is not just about the absence of disease, but our role, our job in research and policy and advocacy is to create a place of well being for all. And that requires us to shift systems and culture through training, research, technical assistance, policy, advocacy, and community centered collaboration. Because our vision is really that all Black mamas and babies thrive. Next slide, please. So, this is important, you know, as a reproductive justice. Um, organizer. We talk a lot about the importance of justice, but we don't talk about kind of how we got here. Why do we need to focus on justice? Because we had such a long history of reproductive oppression. You know, from 16, 19, 17, 19, legally Black women's bodies, Black people, gender nonconforming people's bodies could be sold, raped. Um, our children could be taken from us. And then even after the transatlantic slave trade ended in 1720, slavery was still legal. So the economic engine for the United States of America were the uteruses of black women's bodies. So you see the creation of my field of modern gynecology and J. Marion Sims practicing on three black women and many other black women's bodies without anesthesia, even though it was available to keep the economic engine of this country going. And then when slavery was ended, then we moved to population control, body shaming, eugenics, sterilization, because no longer are the production of black women's uteruses needed for capital. And so therefore we blame black women and people, indigenous people for the, all the and people of color around the world for the outcomes um, when it comes to health outcomes without really acknowledging the harm of sterilization of eugenics and blaming communities that are not invested in. Next slide, please. And as a black woman who was able to present in Geneva at the UN, it was deeply humbling. I presented at the city government in New Orleans, um, the state house in Baton Rouge and Congress a few times. But being in Geneva, sitting at the UN, understanding that the United States does not operationalize a human rights standard. Every other high income country says, by virtue of your birth, you are valuable and we must invest in you. So they do things like free childcare, free healthcare, free college. You, when people think about um, rights in the United States, we think of civil rights, right? The civil rights movement of, for Black Americans to fight for the right to be able to desegregate schools and be able to vote. We think about the LGBTQI community, civil rights fight to be able to be seen as fully human so they could be married to one another. We are constantly trying to be seen as fully human through the law in this country because we don't have a standard that we see all people, no matter their religion, their gender, their geography, their age, all people should have the ability to thrive. And so therefore our role as government is to invest in their ability to have well-being. Next slide, please. Everything is a thing with a history and a set of relations, including how we fund women's health in the United States of America and around the globe. Understanding anything in our everyday requires that we know how, something about how it arose and developed and how, how it fits into the larger context of systems of which it is a part. It is important to note that when we speak of systems and institutions, we are still talking about people collectively organized in a way that it's based on a particular set of rules and relations. So if we're gonna undo the harm and no longer be the worst outcomes of maternal health in the industrialized world, we have to be honest about our history, about our history of reproductive oppression and the continued choices we make around shaming, population control and planning versus well-being and justice and joy. Next slide, please. So racism affects our body both directly through chronic stress or indirectly through discrimination, through multiple systems of, of oppressions, through differential access to high quality schools, safe neighborhoods, good jobs, and quality health care. Next slide, please. So we must understand then, as y'all are brilliant researchers, all of you, um, you know, I'm a simple OBGYN. We picked it because it's two books, OB and GYN. But so many of you have very deep understanding and knowledge around research and indicators. So there's some indicators that we use inside of health and public health and maternal and child health that are very commonly used. It's a data point. It's a measurement that's limited by our current reality. An indicator is a product 
of our past understanding of public health and science, systems like the NIH, like the federal government, like, like CBOs are more apt to adhere, adhere to specific prescribed indicators than determine alternatives. I'll give you a common one that you all check off all the time, marital status, single black female, black women who are unmarried is the end of all things, right? We, we track that for everything. It creates preterm birth, it creates, if I would just get married, I would have had my child on time. It will fix all of our social ills if black women would just get married, right? So that's our indicator for success, success marriage. What's a framework? A framework can be a vision. It expands our understanding of our current reality. It allows us freedom. We can be free, y'all. We can, everybody, nobody's free until everybody's free. We can be free to explore new language, new indicators. And we have to explore alternatives to our traditional data collection application and question our historical construction of our healthcare system. If we don't question it, then how are we gonna continue? How are we gonna have in these inequities without being honest about what framework we're currently utilizing? Human rights is a framework, reproductive justice is a framework, birth equity is a framework. And in those frameworks, the indicator of marital status is not what will get us to justice, to human rights or equity. If you want to check, measure an uh, indicator of, 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 of that, of well being, is things like your, your pregnancy well being, your ability to thrive, your ability to be seen as fully human. So until we can move away from focusing on things like marital status, pregnancy intention, which come from a white supremacy patriarchal framework that we all do without even thinking about. Like you automatically say, we have to check out marital status. If all the people who are under resourced all got married without ever being invested in their ability to have access to um, wealth or access to well-being, them just being married to one another is not gonna improve their maternal and child health outcomes. Just as there are very high resource people who have um, domestic violence issues, who are not socially supported, so just the act of marriage is not what makes you have better outcomes. It's the social support and the wealth building that do. Why don't we measure that as our indicators and not marital status? Next slide, please. Because we know it's important to recognize that it is not my black skin that made me have a, a child that weighed less than a pound, but the racism that impacted my black body, despite me intending to be pregnant, despite me being married, and despite me being healthy at the time. And so it's important for us to no longer see the root cause or the risk factor when it comes to maternal health as the behaviors or the choices or the genes or the kidneys or the cervixes or the uteruses of black people because they're no different from white people but the racism that impacts our bodies and our ability to thrive next slide please so that means we have to understand that race is not real not in the way that racists think it is race does not equal a genetic cluster we finished the entire human genome project your director knows that he's been talking about it since 2003, right? There is no genetic basis of race. Race is not biology, but racism has biological effects and social constructs are real for those who hold them. Race does not equal an ethnic group. It does not equal a population. It does not equal ancestry, just like gender does not equal sex, right? These are social constructs. There are four different ways to describe, conceptualize and discuss human variation and they cannot be used interchangeably. A belief in a hierarchy of human value based upon skin color has been operationalized around the world and codified in how you all send out grant reports and how you all decide what is valuable to be released as, as research. So until we undo this belief of a hierarchy of human value based upon skin color, we're never gonna see health inequities end. I was taught in medical school in the late 1990s, which in my mind is not that long ago, in my embryology class, that there were three biological races. The professor was teaching about skin types. And he said, mongoloid, caucasoid, and negroid. Many people who are researchers who are working across the United States still believe because they were taught by powerful institutions that there was a biological basis of race because we were medicine, healthcare, public health have been deeply colonized by white supremacy. There is no biological basis of race. We ended the, um, the e.g. the glomerular filtration rates um, differences. We worked on a C-section calculator. All the places that race is, and racism have been embedded into how we provide research and care. Really think about how that impacts the work that you all do there at the NIH and around the world. Next slide, please. So that means we have to have the definitions of racism. When we first started six years ago, people had very, they would get nervous when I say the word racism and it still happens today. There are journal articles when we submit and they see the word racism, we get many of you uh, reviewers who write back, but that's toxic. It's not toxic, it's not emotional. When I say racism, I'm not, it's not a judgment. It's not a moral, I'm not saying you're a bad person. Um, there is a 
current and historical belief in a hierarchy of human value is codified. That's not emotional. So let's talk about these definitions. So first is institutionalized. These are the structures, policies, practices, and norms resulting in differential access to the goods, services, and opportunities of societies by race. So in our field, a concrete example of that in healthcare and public health is Medicare and Medicaid. When they were created in 1965, this country was deeply, by law, legally segregated, and they were used really as tools to try to desegregate hospitals who had black wards and white wards. It's not that long ago. Many of you might have worked in those hospitals, might have done research in those, in those labs that didn't allow black researchers to be the, public, the person who published the research. And we still operationalize that belief that the black people who were in those spaces were not valuable enough to lead the lab, to be in charge of the research. Personally, mediate is what you think of when I say the word racism. And that's the tiki torch, I called you a bad name, the bias and differential assumptions about the abilities and motives and intentions of others by race. That does happen. It happens in public health, it happens in research, it happens in healthcare. It is not the overarching reason we have health inequities, but it does happen. And then this last one is really important as we think about how we are gonna move forward. How are all of us gonna move forward? So for so long, health disparities work, Health inequities work has been seen as this burden on people of color to fix ourselves. Y'all got to figure out what's wrong with y'all. So here, you go do that research. We recognize that the belief is killing white people too. This idea that you should have things because you're a white makes you do things like not vote to have Medicaid expansion in your state. Meanwhile, thousands of people are dying because they need access to um, the treatments for opioid and substance abuse. The more that we, racism is killing white people too, and so until we undo this harm, we're all gonna keep having the worst outcomes in the industrialized world. Next slide, please. So that means we have to have an understanding of reproductive justice because that's our future. That's how we get out of this mess that we've created through eugenics, through patriarchy and through white supremacy. The path forward is the path to reproductive justice because nobody's free until everybody's free. Next slide, please. So back in 1994, the women of African descent for reproductive justice created a concept that acknowledges the conditions that dictate women's reproductive outcomes. As a black mama of a 10 year old son, I do not allow him to play outside with a toy gun because like Tamir Rice's mother, I worry that someone will think he's an adult, a policeman, another person, and although he's only 10, shoot him. As a black mama, I worry about outliving my children. So reproduction for black mamas is not simply bodily control around access to contraception and abortion, our reproductive lives continue from the, when we are inside of the uteruses of whomever we're um, is impregnated to when we, when we die. The entire spectrum, the full spectrum from osteoporosis to fibroids, we want you to care about all the things as well as mass incarceration, police violence, all these things impact infant mortality, prematurity, hypertension. And so we need you to care about our intersecting identities. We're not just one um, reproductive coercion controlling thinking about black women when it comes to decreasing, giving us access to long acting contraceptions. What about our ability to create families, investing our ability to make families, infertility, we desire that as well, right? So the reproductive justice affirms that uh, we have the ability to have a child when and if we like, how we like, under the conditions we like, and of what setting we like. That could be in a home birth, that could be in a birth center, that we can parent them with the necessary social supports so what is the research you are doing around the social supports that we need for safe environments? We know that um, pollution increases your risk of infant mortality. Where, is the, where are the studies on heat and climate and pollution and not blaming and shaming black women for having safe sleep in a crib? How are you holding the systems accountable that our babies are dying because of pollution that's in the air and in the water and in the ground? And this last one is really important as we think about the cases in Mississippi and Texas going on right now. We have the right to control our own bodies we have the right to make decisions about when we are viable, what is viable. The word viable is not a medical term. Just like race is a social construct, this idea of viability and what age group, what age is viability has been a slippery slope since that was the compromise made at the beginning of Roe v. Wade. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are the, we were just recently the um, In Our Own Voices along with multiple other black women led organization. Um, created the Black Reproductive Justice Policy Agenda that you can find on their website. This is Loretta Ross and um, Monica Simpson from Sister Song. They have a lot of resources on their websites as well. But what we wanna go from advocacy and you all think of reproductive justice as this outside thing that black women are doing to how you must do it in your work. The NIH must understand that it has created reproductive injustice, 
through policy, through practice, through research. So the NIH must become a source of undoing that harm by understanding what reproductive justice is. Next slide, please. So let's talk about these re research injustices, right? Next slide, please. Research injustice is a situation where community voices and experiences are dismissed. Somebody say hello. If you can't say amen, say ouch. And um, ignored or information is inaccessible due to jargon, money, lack of translations, narrative, exclude or represent community experiences and communities lacking control of the production, documentation, possession, and dissemination of their own data or stories. When we first found out and started talking about the fact that black mothers were dying in childbirth three to, three to four times the rate of their white counterparts and in places like New York City, eight to 12 times the rate of their black um, white counterparts. We knew with the history of research and justice, what was going to be the common themes around jargon, money, translation, and the communities, blaming and shaming black mamas saying, of course they're dying. They're so fat, they are so non-compliant. You know, they miss all their appointments and they don't ever listen to anything we say. It's odd whenever I hear that, because I always think, so that acts as if no other group is non-compliant or that also acts as if um, the data shows us. So we had to get data and do the research to show despite income, CDC shows us last year, despite income, black women are, despite education, five times more likely to die in childbirth than their white counterparts. So how do we, really reframe this conversation. Next slide, please. So what's NIH's plan to confront research injustice? In June, 2021, the director released a plan to eliminate big gaps in grant funding awarded to white and minority scientists, to um, programming to recruit, mentor, and retain researchers, and plan to spend $60 million on projects aimed to reducing health disparities, another 30 million to study and address the impact of structural racism and discrimination on minority health. This new funding is incredible. It's an opportunity for us to undo the harm of research injustice. Next slide, please. Because we know that these disparities and, and grant applications by race, if you can see for black folks, we're just not getting the funding. We're just not getting the funding. Next slide, please. And still it continues looking at not only by um, disparities in, uh, from 2013 to 2020 is not improved, right? Well, here we are still, we're still working to fight for getting more funding and more access. Next slide, please. And so what are some major assumptions? How do we get here? What is the history of why we have these, this gap in the research allocation? There are no, one of the major assumptions is there are no solutions or interventions for improved black maternal health that black women themselves do not already possess. We believe and we know we've been doing this without the money. And we've been surviving and thriving without being seen, without getting access. The shame and blame narratives that dominate much of the discourse about data on black mamas is not insightful or helpful. And it perpetuates a dangerous myth that we need white people to serve a default standard for the rest of the population. And the current conduct of research, specifically the disassociation of social and clinical determinants of health is both problematic and unethical. Next slide, please. There is a lack of consideration of structural factors that leads to this systemic underestimation or misappraisal of black maternal clinical risk factors. There's a disregard for structural factors that increase risk to poor health outcomes. Compounding structural determinants of health are proposed fixes to so-called health disparities that focus on quality improvement without equity because there is no quality improvement without equity. Centered on individuals that fail to acknowledge the structures of power that are often out of reach for marginalized communities, like putting all your centers in hospitals downtown because it's easier for you all to go from hospital to hospital, but patients are miles away taking buses and trains to get to you. The issues are reinforced by silos that exist in the provision of clinical health services where much of the reason that drives interventions for um, improved health outcomes is conducted. Next slide, please. There's lack of informed consent lack of knowledge or compensation for scientific awards and discoveries, explicit coercion of communities of color and inflicted harm, and the criminalization of pregnant people and punitive use of various contraceptive methods and involuntary sterilization. Next slide, please. Oh, <laughs> next slide, please. <laughs> so we have a working group, a BMA research working group that has a conceptual framework looking at reproductive justice, birth justice, human rights, Black feminism, womanism, research justice. Next slide, please. 
<laughs> and so what are some best practices and guidelines for holistic care? Number one, recognize and respect the rights of Black mamas, understand the historical, social, cultural, political, and economic context in which Black mamas live in their lives, invest, hear me again, invest. Don't think we're going to program our way to justice. It's not going to happen. We must invest in Black women as researchers, not just giving us a gift card so you can hear about what we're doing and then go back to your consistent framework and ignoring the brilliance of Black women as researchers. Fund and conduct ethical research that benefits Black mamas. Honor and commit to community engagement through the entire research process and include health equity and social justice as key themes in research with Black mamas. Next slide, please. And some policy and advocacy opportunities. Next slide, please. We know that going downstream versus upstream is where we've been. I can tell you as a provider practicing OBGYN in New Orleans, in the late 90s and the early 2000s, constantly the 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes that a patient would have for, with me was no way going to be able to impact all the other things that are impacting their lives, right? And so it was exciting when we moved away from this individual behavior, blaming and shaming and genetics, and then having these inequities based upon individuals to the understanding the, social, the psychosocial stress that comes from the social determinants of health. What we haven't talked about yet are these top two structures, the power and wealth imbalance that creates the social determinants of health. How is NIH funded and funding research, not just on the social determinants of health, but the power and wealth imbalance that creates the social determinants of health inequities. And then what creates that power and health and wealth imbalance? Racism, classism, and gender oppression. If we were in another context, you might add, or you could add in my own state of Louisiana, religious fundamentalism. We need research that undoes the harms of oppression. We need research that looks at the ways that this trickle down from racism, classism, and gender oppression to the bodies of, of having actual dis distribution of disease, illness, and well being. Next slide, please. We created a birth equity agenda. We have five critical measures for ensuring the United States has a proper infrastructure and resources in place to achieve equitable eternal health outcomes. And number one, because eugenics, because white supremacy, because a history of patriarchy were created and operationalized at the highest level of government, population control, the highest levels of government, just taking control, changing the name from a control to affairs, but not changing how you view and see the people that you're working with doesn't change the harm that's caused by your actions. So from the highest level of government, we need reproductive health and autonomy to be promoted. We want health to be considered as a priority and a right. So excited that President Biden consistently says health is a right. Our job now, guys, everybody on this call is to operationalize that, to learn from other countries who actually know how to make health a right. How would we do that in the United States in a country that has the vast differences when it comes to gender, race, religion, geography. We could show the world what it looks like to believe all people are valued and valuable and valued despite having looking different, speaking different languages in one context. We, that would make us totally exceptional to really show health is a right in a diverse nation. Individuals and institutions must be held accountable and discrimination that leads to disparate health impacts. We know it is unacceptable that we went from 2007 until this last year without accurately counting maternal deaths. No more can we ever have any maternal death go unnoticed or uncounted. And the government's involvement, especially now, considering Texas, Mississippi, and all the other states, government's involvement should not be states' rights versus individual rights. We should have ended that conversation when we completed the Civil War, but we keep litigating states' rights versus human rights over and over again. Hopefully, we will now understand that government involvement, reproductive health, may not intrude on reproductive freedom, agency, and autonomy. There's no state's rights is more important than my human rights. Next slide, please. So leverage nurses. I'm a physician and I can tell you, we are not the first, we're not the folks that should be leading this culture shift. It is not us. Leverage nurses and other staff who are more better equipped for this culture shift around collaborative care, training around collaborative care. We need to listen, follow, learn from others who are better equipped. Influence partner organizations to prioritize racial equity in their network training and workshops for staff to develop more cultural competence and manage implicit bias in response to maternal experiences of racism, work with community action teams to improve citywide transportation, lead um, in response to overall divestment in, in health and safety, and advocate for a community-wide community advocacy campaign. Next slide, please. 
This is my last slide. Um, every, if you've heard me speak before, I talk about Ibram Ip, um, Kendi's book, um, The History of Racist Ideas in America. And in that book, he separates folks out to three groups. He still does. He has written other books. He won the American Book Award. He's now at Boston University. He leads the Anti-Racism Institute there. And he has a book called How to Be an Anti-Racist because this is all of our work. At this point, it is all of our work to end racism. If we don't, we're never gonna see, we're gonna continue to see health inequities and we can keep researching it and keep looking at, different, looking at our neighbors and saying, why do we have the same outcomes? So in that book, he follows some very important people because he's a historian. And one of the people he follows is Abraham Lincoln as a person whose black family members have been in the United States of America for at least eight generations. Love Abraham Lincoln. Yes, free the slaves, thank you, Abe. But he was a complicated person. So near the end of his presidency, the five top black folks got to go to the White House. I can picture it now. And they're sitting there with him and he says, hey guys, listen, I got a few million dollars. Take your people and go back to Liberia or even Panama. I don't really care, a black or brown place, but just not here. And so the, the guys, the, the five black men look at him and say, well, no, nah, we don't think so. We've been here for 250 years building all this for free. We think we're going to keep our people here and stay. But his response is so important. And it's important for you as you think about what you're going to do next, how you see yourself in this movement next. His response to them was, but guys, you're being so selfish. We don't want to talk about that right now. We need to move on. I mean, what, if we have to make these changes, it's just so important. You're, you got to move on. Guys, if you want to, you're being selfish. If you just go back to your country, your, your continent, we, could have, we can go about our lives and the war would end. Because although Abraham Lincoln was a good and kind man and moral man, he believed slavery was bad. He also believed black people were broken. We were subhuman. We had come here to serve our purpose, to create this country, and we needed to go back. He was a segregationist. So if you were on this call, if you are listening to my voice and you believe your research is important because you're fixing broken black bodies, we need you to stop. If you want to be actively anti-racist, you understand there's nothing broken about black bodies, uteruses, cervixes, placentas. We don't need you any more biological research on why we have disparate outcomes on black maternal health. The only thing that makes us black is you believing we're black because of racism. So any kind of tool that you're doing to work on health inequities, if you're gonna be actively anti-racist, your strategy for ending health inequities must be both political and social because racism is a political and social construct, not a biological one. And we all want you all to be actively anti-racist. Thank you. That's it.